know we all want our kids to, you know, live happily ever after and have a marriage that lasts, you know, until death do us part. And today, our Heavenly Father is going to show us His plan for how to make that happen. Uh, and by the way, this whole, you know, thing about, like, preparing your kids for a strong marriage, like, Amy and I are right there. Like, it, it, this is hitting hard for us uh, because our kids... Uh, are in college and they're both at an age where like literally any day like they could meet the one and it's a little unnerving uh, because honestly it just it feels like yesterday like we were watching Elmo's world and playing Candyland right and I've said this before and so I'm going to say it again when it comes to rearing kids the days are long but the years are short the days are long but the years are short. And the things that God's put in my heart to talk to you about today, like Amy and I have done most of them since the, uh, early on. Uh, now, not all of them, but most of them. And by the way, that should actually bring hope to people who <clears throat> maybe if you're getting a late start in following Christ or getting a late start in rearing your kids God's way, listen, I'm just telling you from personal experience, it is never too late to start. <laughs> the point is, you gotta just start. Um, now, those of you who have a strong marriage, here's what I know about you. You want, more than anything, to pass that on to your kids. Like, you want your kids, and even your grandkids, to have a strong marriage. And those of you who have been divorced, here's what I know about you. Even though you've survived divorce and you're okay, more than anything, you want to make sure your kids never go through what you went through. In fact, you would do almost anything to prevent your kids from going through something like that. And today, our Heavenly Father is going to give us some very specific things to do so that we can stack the deck so that we can make sure that our kids have the best chance of having a message or having a marriage that honors Him. Now, quick word to those who don't have kids, or, <clears throat> or maybe for you, kids are so far in the future, it's like, like, why should I even be listening to this today? Well, two key reasons. First is this, is that st statistically speaking, you probably will have kids one day. And so you need to put these things into practice now and be prepared now to do it even when your kids are one day very, very young so that, you're, again, you're stacking the deck in their favor. And you know what? Even if the Lord never blesses you with kids, you don't have kids of your own, then chances are you will be an aunt or an uncle and you can do these things for your nieces and nephews to prepare them. And you can stack the deck so heavily in those kids' favor that they will most likely have a marriage that honors God. And the, the second reason you listen is that, you know what, just in case your parents never prepped you to have a strong marriage, you can put some of these things into practice so that you can start to prep yourself so that you can, you can put these things in practice so that you can have that strong marriage because God wants you to make it until death do us part. So everything's especially important for you today. Now, like I said, the things we're going to talk about today, it, it's, it's going to stack the deck, okay? But there are no guarantees. Like, wait, look, we all know. Like, kids have free will, and sometimes they're just going to haul off and do things that are contrary to what we have taught them or brought them up to do. But generally speaking, if we will do the things that our Heavenly Father tells us to do, we will stack the deck so heavily in their favor that even if they do stray off the beaten path for a while, they will more than likely come back to it. So, what does God say about preparing my kids for a strong marriage? Go ahead and pull out your message notes, and let's start looking at it. Um, and now to help illustrate, I've actually brought with me a, a backpack today, kid's backpack. Because, you know, just like, you know, you put things in a backpack to, you know, help your kids be successful at school. In the very same way, our Heavenly Father wants us to put things in our kid's backpack of their minds and their hearts so that they can be successful in having a strong marriage that honors the Lord. And so I'm, I'm going to go through some things in here today. And the first thing that God tells us to do is this. Number one, write this down. Is that I need to remember, I need to approach this as a process, 
not an event. Is that I need to approach this as a process, not an event. Now, to, to help illustrate that, I brought with me today a set of AirPods, right? I mean, you've all seen you know, kids wearing these things. You know, they'll have two of them hanging out their ears, and you're thinking, and they're just listening to music. Or a lot of times, some of them, they'll just put one in so they can still have conversation with people. But listen, there's this constant flow of voices in their mind. And in the very same way, God designed things so that you, as parents and aunts and uncles, are to be a constant flow of voices in their mind about relationships, dating, engagement, and marriage. In fact, I really love how the message version of the Bible says it in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. Look at it there. It says this. It says, write these commandments that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you. And get them inside your children. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall into bed at night. And, and since today is about relationships and marriage, listen, you need to talk to your kids on the regular about dating and relationships and marriage okay because look god never intended it to be just like a one-time conversation or a conversation you only have a couple of times because if that if that's the case then the really the only message your kids are getting is that this is only important enough to talk about one two maybe three times during all the years that they're with us that's that's the message that they'll be getting but listen, I also know that the flip side is that you know, like your kids aren't going to want to talk to you about who they like and who they're dating and all that kind of thing. Like I get that, I, I do. But listen, you've got to love your kids enough to take God's word seriously and talk to them on the regular about it. And look, and I, I get it. Like it's a little awkward at first, but listen, if you do it regularly, the awkwardness goes away pretty quickly. And just in case your kids go, oh, mom, dad, it's none of your business. <laughs> That's a chance for you to go, mm -mm, no. It absolutely is our business. Because one of the people you date one day will eventually be a person that you marry. And when you marry that person, they come into this family. And so, oh yeah, it is our business. And so it is your business. You have to talk to them openly about relationships and dating and uh, engagement and marriage. And um, look, and it's a chance for you to tell your kids like, that you love them more than anybody else on the entire planet. And the most important decision they're ever going to make in their life, other than following Jesus, is who they marry. And because you love them so much, you want them to make the wisest choice possible. And you need to tell them, hey, you know, we've got 20, 30, 40 years of experience in seeing people make wise and unwise choices. And so we want to help you with that. I'm going to tell you, like, just that whole premise has sparked so much incredible conversation around our table uh, over the years because we've talked to our kids many times about the wise and unwise choices that we have seen people and some of our friends and some of our college friends and their kids make over the years. I'm telling you, it's, it's been such great conversation. And, and don't worry, like, don't think that we were, like, you know, talking about you. I mean, we actually never used your name. Um, so I'm just I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, but the, the point is, you got to approach this as a process. Like, it's, it's not a one-time event. Here's the second thing. Um, the second thing is this, is that I need to teach them what to look for. You gotta teach them what to look for. Now the context of these verses that we're about to read is that Abraham's son, Isaac, is at the age where he can marry. But Abraham, like, he doesn't want his son to take a wife from the people in the community because he lives in an incredibly pagan community. And so he realizes that this would be a bad idea. So he calls his most trusted servant in, and here is what happens. In Genesis 24, the first four verses, it says this. Abraham was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. 
He said to the senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son, Isaac. Okay, now look. When it says to get someone from his own relatives, he's not saying like, hey, go get a first cousin, okay? <laughs> Hello, this is not Arkansas, all right? Um, <laughs> hmm. Hit a little close for some, okay? Yeah, just kidding. Um, but listen, he, what he's telling his servant he, to do, he's saying, the most important thing is, go get someone who believes in God. Because, and he's not talking about, he's talking about go to his clan, go to his tribe, and all the people in that community, go get someone from there because he knows that the people from his clan, his tribe, like they believe in following God. He does not tell his servant, go find someone who's the most beautiful. Go find someone who's an influencer. Go, go find someone who's got a lot of money or who has a lot of social position or even, you know, has all her own teeth. Like, no, no, no. He's saying, go and find someone who believes. Who believes. Let me ask you. What are you teaching your kids to look for in a spouse one day? Are you teaching your kids what to look for in a spouse one day? Because look, you need to be. Because otherwise, they're going to learn about it from other kids at school. Or what they see on TV. Or what they see in the movies. And what you need to do is you need to coach them to look deeper, much deeper. Because look, let's be honest, like beauty's going to fade, right? Like those guys, you know, with their broad shoulders and their chiseled muscles, all that's going to slide to their belly one day, <laughs> right? And, and, you know, those, 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 those girls, you know, with their, you know, stunning figure, like after they have a few babies, like it's not going to be the same, Okay. Beauty is going to fade. And so relationships and marriage have to be based on something much, much deeper than that. And the, the most important thing you can teach them is to look for that something deeper. And the most important thing, the most important thing that you can teach them is to look for someone who believes in and follows Jesus. That's why in the backpack, the second thing I brought today is a cross necklace. Because the single most important thing that you can teach your kids to look for is to look for someone who is an active follower of Christ. Because Jesus is the one who is going to get them through hard times. Jesus is the one who's going to answer their prayers. Jesus is the one who's going to provide for them. Jesus is the one who's going to be with them when they you know, go to a dark place one day and they're really struggling. He is the one who's going to be there. And so listen, you need to hammer over and over and over and over and over and over and over again that every single person they date is a Christ follower. They have because... Whoever, whoever they marry is going to come from someone they're dating. And so if they're dating someone who's not a Christ follower, well, the question is why? Why in the world are you dating someone who's not a Jesus follower? Is it because he or she is so good looking? Is it because he or she is the only one asking? Those are not good enough reasons to say yes. Because relationships need to be based on something so much deeper. And it's up to you as a mom and dad, aunt and uncle, to teach them what that deeper thing is, what to look for. And by the way, while you're teaching them what to look for, you're also simultaneously teaching them what not to look for. But it doesn't stop there. Here's number three. Write this one down. I need to pray for my kids and their spouses now. Pray for my kids and their spouses now. Now, look, I, I realize the verses that we're about to read are just talking about prayer in general and not specifically about, you know, praying for future husbands and wives. But listen, it includes that. It certainly includes that. And so look what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives 
The one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And is there, is there anything more important to pray for than who your kids are going to marry? Uh, this, honestly, this is just one of those things I didn't start doing until a couple of years ago. I should be straight up. Like, I just, for whatever reason, just didn't take it seriously enough until the kids started getting older. And this is, this is one of those things, like, I wish I had started doing earlier. But listen, no matter how old your kids are, it's not too early to start, and it's also not too late. Just start. And, you know, what you pray for for your kids depends on the ages of your kids. For instance, like when your kids are younger, maybe what you want to be praying for is that you want to be praying for the household that those kids are growing up in, of their, their, you know, their future spouses are growing up in. You might want to pray that those, their future spouses are responding to discipline and aren't rebellious. You might want to pray that their hearts are kept pure by what they're seeing on TV and by what they experience. You might want to pray that they go to a good church that's teaching them how to follow Jesus in a real way. Pray for those sorts of things. And then, you know, when they get older, things are going to change in how you pray for your future kids. In fact, I want to tell you what I'm praying right now for my kids and their future spouses. Now, here's what I'm not praying for. I'm not praying for my, future, my kids' future spouses to be Christ followers. We have had that conversation, and they are already dialed in with that. My kids are not going to date someone who's not a Christian. So we've already gotten that part settled. And so I brought with me today in this backpack, I brought my journal from home. This is my prayer journal that I use every single day when I pray. And on my prayer list of the things I pray for every day is to pray for the future spouses of my kids. And so I want to share with you the 10 things that I pray for each one of those future spouses. Now, some of them are similar, some of them are different, <clears throat> you know, because my kids are different. But I just want to share with them, share them with you. For my daughter Libby, when I'm praying for her future husband, here's what I pray. I pray that he will be a man who really loves God and that he really loves her, that he's kind, that he's intelligent, that he is patient, that he's fun, that he's driven, that he'll be a good dad, that he'll fit with our family, that he's pure. And for my son, Ben, when I pray for his future wife, I pray that she's someone who's happy, who's loving, who's beautiful, not just on the outside, but inner beauty, that she's intelligent, that she's kind, that she's a partner in ministry, that she'll be a good mom, that she'll have a servant's heart, that she'll fit with our family, and that she'll be pure. That's what I'm praying for for my kids' future spouses. What are you praying for for your kids' future spouses? What do you have written in a prayer journal that you're praying for? <laughs> Listen, feel free to steal any of these things that I've got. Like, it, that's totally fine. But pray for your kids' future spouses. It's so incredibly important. And look, Jesus says, if you ask, it'll be given to you. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be open. So you know what? Let's just take Jesus at his word. Let's take him at his word. So let's ask. Let's seek. Let's knock. And one of the coolest things you can start doing is praying for your kids' future spouses now. All right, here's the last thing. Number, number four is this. Model for them. You got to model for them. You got to be a model for your kids in all things, but especially when it comes to marriage. Look what the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. He says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Basically, Paul's like, hey, if you want to know how to follow Jesus and how you live, watch what I'm doing. Be follow my example as I am trying to follow Christ. And so, uh, in the backpack, to help illustrate this, I brought with me, I brought Ken and Barbie. Uh, 
I, I'm not sure what happened to Ken's shirt. I think he's just showing off. But um, I brought, not that I think that Amy and I are Ken and Barbie. I mean, we're not because I'm looking here. Ken does not have an ever-expanding bald spot. So uh, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is this, is that we are models for our kids. Your kids are watching you. Like it or not, know it or not, they are watching. And by the way, that should be incredibly sobering, right? But they're watching you for how to model a great marriage. They're watching you for how you are developing the spiritual, the emotional, the recreational, and the physical side of your marriage, like we talked about in week one. They're, they're watching to see how to date and how to one day be engaged, because I'm telling you, they are going to ask you questions about how you met and how you got engaged. They're going to want to know those stories. We talked about that in week two of this series. They're going to look at you as a model for how to handle conflict like we talked about in week three they look at you as a model for how to you know keep the fires of romance alive in a marriage like we talked about in week four they're going to look at you as examples for how to keep a marriage going during the empty nest years like like we talked about last week look you don't have to be perfect okay your kids already know you're not perfect but you have to try to align your life as best you can with Jesus when it comes to these things. And, and look, and just in case you're carrying around a lot of guilt about mistakes you've made in your past, look, just admit to your kids the mistakes that you've made and let them learn from your mistakes just as much as they've learned from your victories and triumphs. So look, please, like, align your life with Jesus don't make the mistake of just taking all this stuff that we've been talking about these last several weeks as you know, just good advice. It's not good advice. It's God's word. And, and, and even if you're not married, one day when you are married, align your life and your marriage with Jesus because he wants to use you to prepare your future kids or your nieces and nephews with uh, with Christ so they can have a strong marriage too. Oh, look, and there's a lot riding on all this. Look, and I'm telling you, Amy and I, like, we're right in it with you. We are doing our best to align our lives and our marriage with Jesus as best we possibly can because we know that our kids are watching us too. Like, we're all in it together. And we all want our kids to have strong marriages because, look, here's the deal. All this stuff is way too hard to do without Jesus, right? Life is too hard and life is too long to even attempt to do any of this without Jesus. So if you've never come to a place in your life where you have asked Jesus to come into your life, like you need to start there. Because Jesus died on a cross so that his death could purchase your forgiveness. So that his death could pay the price for your sin, for my sin, for the sins of all of us. But the only way to receive his forgiveness is to ask him to come into your life. So if you've never asked him to come into your life, or maybe you've been putting it off, or maybe you're not sure if you've ever done that before, start there. If you're ready to do that today for the first time in your life, there's a prayer that you can pray. It's in your message notes at the bottom. I want you to take a moment. I want you to pray that prayer while I pray for all of us. So everybody, bow your head, close your eyes. Lord Jesus, mm. Thank you that your word is just so practical sometimes. It, it, it just kind of clears the fog and makes it so clear what you want us to do. So I pray for every future marriage that you would stack the deck so that those marriages can honor and glorify you. And you would help us as parents, as aunts, as uncles, as grandparents to have ongoing conversations with our kids and grandkids and nieces and nephews. That you would help us to teach them that the most important thing is to find someone who follows you with their whole heart. You would clarify for each one of us what you want us to be praying for our kids' future spouses. And then you would help us to align our lives with you, to model for them as best we can. 
what it is to follow you in all things, including marriage. We love you, Lord Jesus. Do this in us and through us. And we all ask it in your name. Amen. Amen.